This is Gloria and Andrew, both first generation immigrants, and today they are worth $4,180,000. And while you may think that this money was given to them, they actually both come from poor families. I grew up on a farm, and Gloria grew up in, in Chile. And after moving to the US, they rapidly understood how to play the finance game. It's not that we've done really well making money, we've just done really well not losing money. In this video, not only will we reveal their deepest personal finance secrets, but we'll also learn what they believe Americans are doing that prevents them from reaching financial stability. Let's dive in. Welcome to Finance Action, the show where we take action. My name is Roman, and today I have the pleasure to introduce you to Gloria and Andrew. How are you guys doing? Good. Very good. Excellent. All right, guys, let's look at their profile. I'm going to start with ladies first, Gloria. Gloria, you're 42 years old. You're originally from Chile, South America. You currently live in Las Vegas, and you work as a fitness instructor. Is that right? Yes. Excellent. Andrew, you guys have been married for nine years. Congratulations. Let's look at your profile. You are 55 years old. You're originally from New Zealand. You also live in Las Vegas. You've been in the United States for 23 years and you currently work as a business owner. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Looking at the way you've rated your personal finances from cheating to Mayday, I'm glad to see that you guys have rated yourself as I'm okay. Congratulations. And you will see uh, this is going to be an exciting story because there is money to speak about and uh, investments, decisions that we're going to discuss a little bit together. I'm going to start right away with you, Gloria. Walk me through a little bit about kind of what has been your upbringing and what has been your life. Well, I was born in Chile and uh, in a communist regime with Pinochet. Okay. So my mom left Chile when I was four. Okay. My mom has 16 brothers, so that was a very big family. And in those times, that was tough to feed all of them. Okay. So it was, yes, we were poor. And because of the regime, there was everything restricted. So you didn't have access to anything. Or food. Food, yeah. W walk me a little bit through kind of what was this experience at the time, because there are still countries right now that live under a communism regime. But in your case, kind of how did you experience that life? What was it? We were the communists because my family was communist. Oh, your family was communist. Yes. And what does that mean? That means that you work for everybody. Uh, everything that you belong or everything that you own belongs to everybody. Okay, that's an interesting yeah. new take. All right. We'll not express opinions on this. But uh, as you can imagine, you know, the communism regime has not prospered under different eras. And so, okay, so you live... Chile, you moved to Spain, where you spend a lot of your time. Walk me through kind of what has been your life in Spain, because you are in your 40s and you just arrived four years ago. Yeah. What was the financial environment for you in Spain? I lived uh, 17 years in Spain before I moved here. Okay. And I was over there working as a realtor. Okay. I had my own company. What's the mindset in Spain for people that, that live in that country? If you can live off the government, it's probably easier to have a company over there because you have a lot of um, help. Um, if you have three, four, or five kids, you can live there pretty easy without working. Um, foreigns can go there and have a pretty good life without working. So the ones that work and pay taxes are probably the ones that suffer the most. I see. And so you're working in Spain, transitioning to the United States. What has been your experience with that difference in culture? First, everything was huge, right? Compared to Europe. Or Europe, everything is tiny and, and hard to move. Here, everything was huge, huge cars, huge houses. And I started looking at, there was so much abundance. Hmm. Tell me more. Yeah, I started seeing like, People have access to so many things. Um, it's easy to get a good job or get paid well by not being very educated for a start. What brought you to make this difference? How do you compare that to what? Uh, well, I started looking for jobs and applying for jobs. And I was, I was amazed how many jobs I had offered, like how many job offers I had. And I had this privilege to choose what I wanted to do or who I wanted to work with. And that's not the case? It back is the case in, here in America. But back in South in America? No, what do you South mean America. by that? 
Well, over there, if you have a job offer, probably you have to stick with that. And there's no many jobs. There's no many companies because of the socialism regime. So people don't open companies over there. They rather do something else or they invest in something else or they go away or abroad. So, yeah. So the lack of entrepreneurs over there, there is lack of jobs. Okay, so here I'm going to bring a little bit more texture uh, into into that aspect. Um, I've had the chance to, you know, work across Asia and Europe. Uh, and so let me, again, uh, complement a little bit with what you're saying. So I, I don't want to generalize in saying that European countries, especially socialist countries, you know, there is no opportunity for entrepreneurship. But what I believe, Gloria, in a way you're trying to uh, say is that it is true that the United States allows the opportunity for the people that really want to go after it to really push and engage with entrepreneurship. When, for example, in France, and I'm sure it's similar in, in, in Spain, uh, as soon as you start, you already tax 40% no matter what you do on the first year. Exactly. So it's, you know, it becomes difficult to kind of have that spirit when on the side you don't have to do as many things and benefit from the government help across so many different sectors. If you're unemployed, if you have kids, if you have... Eh, la, 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 pretty much you can live comfortably without having to truly go after it. Whereas in the United States, you're kind of on your own, right? Uh, in fact, what's happening sometimes is, you know, we have families that are coming to Europe with, you know, tens of uh, children and right away they can benefit from social help and kind of live of that. So, which, uh, which makes it something I noticed when I started going over to Spain specifically, it makes it hard for a small business yeah. because of the social support mechanism there, the small business is responsible for that. So, for example, if Gloria has an employee, a, a woman, and she gets pregnant, Gloria had to pay that woman for two years. Um, and the woman may have only worked for Gloria for three months. Yeah. And if she gets pregnant, she's responsible for her for two years. If someone got sick or just... Depression. Depression, something, she, they're responsible. I have to pay that employee so that until he come together. Or <laughs> yeah, it's, so, it's a big problem right now. Uh, it's called I travail or work stop where you have employees and have friends in those industries in Europe. So sometimes, guys, the, the grass is not always greener <laughs> yeah. uh, at right. the neighbor where I have an example of uh, uh, a peer that is a business owner in Europe and she has an employee that has worked with her for three weeks, decided that it was not for her, requested a burnout, and she's been on payroll now for four and a half months. But it is true, though, that... You know, we, again, benefit here in America, and that's also one of the reasons why I'm in the United States, with much respect, is because we have this opportunity. Now, it's not always perfect, but I feel that we have this opportunity uh, to make it. So with this very smooth transition, the opportunity to make it, this is kind of what happened to you, Andrew, coming from New Zealand. So you left New Zealand about 30 years old, but walk me briefly through some of the you know, fluctuations in your life. Okay, upbringing in New Zealand um, was very pleasant. And so I grew up in a farming community and in that place, no one was wealthy, um, but no one was really poor. So I grew up not really knowing about money at all. I didn't really know it existed and I had no idea about the difference between rich and poor. And that kind of developed a mental kind of um, perspective on money which money wasn't important. So I've really kept that until today. I still don't really feel money is important. But today you're worth millions of dollars. So how have you made that happen over time? Which is, which is a little different than what some people that attain some wealth um, do. I wanted, to, uh, I wanted experiences mostly. Um, and it takes money to have experiences. And speaking of experience, you know what I want? Is for you to experience having a true understanding of your own financial situation. 
This is why today's sponsor of the video, guys, is Rocket Money. Rocket Money is the app you need to save more and to manage your money better. Whether you want to analyze your spending habits and create a custom budget that fits with your lifestyle, Rocket Money allows you the chance to automatically monitor where you're spending your money and they will send you a notification if they see that you're overspending in some of the categories. On top of that, Rocket Money allows you the chance to set up smart savings. Whether you're looking for you know, a coming wedding, a down payment on a house, or buying your car cash using some of the strategies that we've mentioned on finance action, Rocket Money allows you the chance to set up money automatically from your accounts without you having to realize. And this is kind of a force mechanism that has worked for many of the people that have come on the show here. There are over 5 million people that are using Rocket Money. And so get started for free today by checking the link in the description below or go to www that rocketmoney.com slash Roman. Thank you so much, Rocket Money, for sponsoring this video. And guys, now let's get back to the juicy part of our story. So, yeah, that's, that's what's driven me to, to find some funds. Okay. So, so you're kind of driven by the need for adrenaline in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this had to go through some steps. Nobody comes here and makes millions of dollars. Uh, how did how did the whole process go? Like walk me through a little bit about kind of you know your 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 mindset around money. Fundamentally, if I was going to give one piece of advice to anyone, that would be something I discovered at a younger age when I was a teenager and that is don't get into debt unless it's an investment. Hmm. And that has given me the ability to really not worry too much about money. Just that one simple rule. They give me some examples of where you applied this. Yeah, coming from New Zealand, I came here originally on a sports visa. Um, and my intention was to stay here um, with that sports visa. But I just found America really interesting. And I had this interest in finding out why America had so much power and globally. So I wanted to stay here to discover that. So I kind of left the sports behind and got distracted and interested in all the other things that I was seeing, you know, in society as well, you know. What have you learned through that process? Not long after coming here, you know, I'm I'm younger, I'm 30 or whatever, and I'm attached to my family and I'm writing emails back. And I remember writing an email to my mother and I said, geographically, climatically and economically, United States is the best place in the world. Socially, I'm not sure. Um, so I was really interested in what was happening here in the society. And because I saw wealth, but I didn't see enough happy people to kind of like relate to the wealth that I was seeing. I saw people with more financial security or stability than I'd seen previously, but not always happy. And I want to know why and, and figure that out. And what have you learned through that? I've learned that debt <laughs> destroys people's happiness. <laughs> it, it cripples them. It takes away so much. So, And there's, there's a lot of debt in this country. A lot of people like have debt. So I'm really fortunate. I really feel fortunate that I decided when I was like 17 years old, I financed something for the first time. I bought an audio amplifier. And by the time I'd paid that audio amplifier off, I hated it because of the 12 months of making payments on it. And I decided this is terrible. And, you know, the loss, it wasn't worth anything anymore. And it just cost me like, you know, twice as much of what I paid for it. Um, and that's when I came up with this decision that I, only in, if it's an investment, it's the only time it's gonna be acceptable to me. So you've been in the United States for 20 years. Yeah. You could say on paper as a couple, right? You guys have made it worth millions of dollars. What prunes you to stay in this country now? It's exciting. So we went back to New Zealand like a year and a half ago and it was after COVID and the world's like frightened, you know, and we're like, what's going to happen? Um, we'll go back to New Zealand and we'll investigate moving back to New Zealand. And we did and we decided, no, it's not for us. Part not of boring. it... Part of it, yeah, for me was I could, I know it too well and I could kind of map out the rest of my life. I believe in New Zealand, there's less opportunities, but there's less um, fun. 
Yeah, there's there's less of a mystery what's around the next corner for me because I know it so well. Here in America, it's so big and vast and there's so much going on. I have no idea what's going to happen next year or next week. So the excitement <laughs> sticks you here. Excitement. You guys have made it in the United States. Uh, and now we're going to look actually about what that means in terms of numbers. Guys, stick around as this gets exciting. I'm going to start with you, Gloria, as a, a fitness instructor. How much are you making per year? Per year, 15,400. Okay. Only working two hours per day. It's not like a full-time job or even a part-time job. But you're taking care of your, of your young son who is two years old. I'm sorry, who is four years old. Any other streams of income? Um, not personally because we have everything together. Together, okay. Now let's look at uh, your company, Andrew. How much are you making from that business company per year? A year, uh, average rate, right, two million. Two million. Gr grossing. Yeah. Gross, but Gross. for you in your pocket as the business owner? Uh, 400,000. $400,000. And very briefly, in a quick line, what does your business. Yeah, electronic security measures predominantly. So everything low voltage. So what that really is, is, is anything with electronics on the end of it. Okay, so Net, kind of network. a tech company, but a service a in the world of service. Company. Yep. Okay, excellent. So do you have any other form of income? We have uh, some rental property in Spain. Okay. Some apartments, four apartments there. Have Did you a, bought cash? Yes. Wow, okay. How much are they generating for you per year? Right now, probably about 40,000. 40,000? Yeah. Okay. Any other source of income? Yeah, we have some uh, other investments and of small what nature ownership in cannabis industry. How much does that bring you? Probably uh, on, a, on a good year, maybe a hundred thousand. But on average, <laughs> average. Now we're looking at about ten thousand. <laughs> <laughs> the whole the cannabis industry is like fallen, going down. Uh, yeah, greatly. Yeah. How do you explain that? Huh. Supply? Too much supply? Too much supply, uh, yeah, partially. Um, a lot of a lot of investors got involved in the industry. It was like this, you know, this, this treasure that everyone thought was going to make. So a lot of money got put into it. Everything came online. Supply was too much. And it was also fashionable when it first opened up. Everyone wanted to go and buy the product. Now it's less fashionable. The green nugget? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to put about $20,000 from that cannabis investment. Is that fair? Yeah, okay. All right. right, together that brings you guys income as a couple today at $470,600 per year. Okay. Congratulations, almost half a million dollar. Net, that is about $27,500 per month. Okay. okay, yeah. If we were to look at the median in the United States for a couple like yourself... 50% uh, make more, 50% make less. Between 50 and 60 years old, it is about $107,000 per year. So you guys are making, you know, 4.5, 4.7 times the median in the United States. Now, what is nice to see is, thank you for providing me with your statements. Actually, a lot of you guys' wealth is not on your bank account. When we look at your statement... I recorded here on your checking account around $10,000. Right. And that is the only liquid money that you guys have. Yes. I am recording here a house in Las Vegas, fully paid off, with a zero value of about $1.5 How did you pay for that house? Yeah, so actually, originally, I paid for half of it and I borrowed from family, the other half. And then I Ooh. paid that off in uh, three, years? three years or something. What, what other form of real estate do you have? So we have four apartments in Spain. What's the value for those? Um, 600000 When did you buy them? We have bought them one by one over the last like four years. Mm -hmm. I see. The first one we bought it when we got married. Maybe it's more than four years. And yeah. then in the last four years we bought two and one, and one belonged to... To, to me when we got married. What was the idea behind buying real estate in Spain? First was moving there and living there. Oh, you wanted at some point too? We were thinking about it. That yeah. was the first thing. Why investing in Spain? What prompted you to do that? Well, it was cheap. 
invest in Spain because an apartment over there, we were talking, the, the apartment that I bought, it was $30,000 back in the day. Ooh. And now it cost it cost 120000 I see. In how long? Five years? Five years. So that was part of the attraction. Yeah. Was okay. we saw great appreciation. So, yeah, rental income for sure, but there's a lot of appreciation yeah, going yeah. on. Where, where we are, it's uh, on, the Med- on the Mediterranean. It's okay. Popular. It's always sunny and yeah. people love it. What other form of real estate do you guys have? Um, I have some property in New Zealand. Okay, tell me more. Okay, so that was an inheritance. So uh, myself and my two sisters. How much do you have on it? Uh, so I, we all have a third each. 30% of a value of what? Of, uh, say, a million. A million dollars, so about $330,000 in land. Any other form of real estate in New Zealand? A house that's being built. Oh, you guys are building one? Yeah. What's going to be the value for it? Around $600,000. $600,000, okay. Um, and I do not, and no other form, any other, other form of real estate? Company bought some land here recently, five acres in Las Vegas. Oh, I see. What's the value for it? It's probably 800000 That you have yourself? Half, half. Half of it? Yeah. Okay. Now, let's look at some of the juice because you are doing very good when it comes to real estate, but when it comes to your own personal investments... Terrible. <laughs> terrible. Absolutely terrible. I had no idea. When we I'm look doing. at your brokerage account yeah. right now, I see a balance for stocks at around fifty thousand dollars, but yep. you've lost fifty percent on that. Yes. How the hell did you lose fifty percent on your stock investments? Because I had no idea what I was doing. Okay. That's and you right. and right now, how is that money being invested? It just sits there with us in stock. Um that as Half of it's still going down. I just don't know what to do with it, so it just kind of sits there. <laughs> it's been going down for a while. It's like the crypto that I've got too. <laughs> Wait, you've invested in crypto? How much? Uh, like 200000 Left? Actually, I haven't really lost there. Probably maybe lost 20000 So let's say I put in 200000 It's about 180 right now. It was worth like about 380 so you, what coins are you investing in crypt, in crypto that you have $200,000 on? Uh, Cardona was the big loss. That's the one I lost a lot on. Okay. Yeah. So. Why are you so, in, so much invested in crypto? What's the idea behind it? Huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't have any great ideas about that at all. Oh, it's just so it's that, just like, a random? You know, some people have made... Okay, so we had a boat in San Diego, right? Okay. And we were... And it was a nice marina in San Diego. And one evening, um, we are in the jacuzzi. There was another couple who were in their 30s. And they were there because the guy had made a ton of money on Bitcoin. And, and he, he didn't thought, really hmm. know. He wasn't spectacular in any way. <laughs> like It's not like he was like brilliant a or genius. attractive or anything. He just really made a lot of money on crypto and he was set for life. So and we thought, it, oh, okay. It's those kind of stories, right, that yeah. make you think, oh, I want that too. Exactly. And yeah. you jump in with no knowledge of what you're doing. At $200,000. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now let's look at some of the fun assets. You also own planes. Yes, yeah. What's the value of that plane? Plane's probably about 200000 Why are you buying a plane? Do you have a pilot license? Yes. Oh, yeah. you do? I fly, yeah. Oh, you fly it? Yep. And you also have a helicopter? I have a helicopter too. What's the value of that? <laughs> That's 150 How often do you fly those? Oh, regularly. Yeah. Like a couple really? days ago, I just We go flew. like to the lake every time we want on the weekends. We I'll take the helicopter. The helicopter's for going to the lake. The good life. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, helicopter, right. helicopter is for me to don't um, throw up. She throw gets, up. she gets. I get she doesn't like the plane. plane. She doesn't like the plane. So I get. So on she's the flying helicopter. the helicopter. She's a hundred. She feels she's a hundred percent safe in the helicopter. All right. So uh, not too bad of a life. Huh? Where, where's your guys' stress level right now? Is a pretty. Uh, we have stresses that we create together. Yeah, as a couple. As a couple. And That's maybe because a lot of abundance. That was. So Gloria had this idea when she came to America and she saw the abundance. And she also saw a lot of social problems, 
you know, she saw drug addicts and she heard these stories and people committing <laughs> that we, we, had. we had. People that we've known that have done that. And they were wealthy? No. No. But just she blames a lot of those problems, the social problems, on the abundance in, in America. And yeah. I can see why she would too. It's like when you are in South America, most of South America is poor. Lot you have no time to be depressed. You, you can't. When you what like, do you mean? I mean, you have to like wake up and go and get a job or otherwise you, you have no work. food, you know? You, you don't have time to stay in bed and think about your life going downhill and your husband doesn't love you anymore or, you know, it's like you, you have to get up and, get up and, and move work. on. You so have three we, kids to feed and you have to just go, go, go. So we went, uh, we went to visit her father a couple of years ago um, in Chile and there was a, a lot of rain and a flood uh, when, at that time we were down there. And the next day we're driving down the road and the dirt roads and there's people out there cleaning the roads and sh with shovels and picks and fixing the roads because the government's not going to do it, right? Mm, I see. But they're doing it and just taking donations and drivers are coming along giving them cash. Coins. Or coins, you know, because that's what people do down there. They, everyone's an entrepreneur because yeah. there's no jobs. Yeah. You live in places with no jobs. You wake up in the morning and think, how can I make money? All right. So with no other assets, ladies and gentlemen, that brings you guys total net worth. I'm sorry. That brings you guys total assets today, if I was to sum everything, yeah. at $4 million. One hundred and eighty thousand hmm, dollars. Okay. Okay. Do you think that um, money links to happiness? No, security. Tell me more. So, um, you know, that's been a driving force for me is to not worry about money, right? So. I need enough money and I need no debt and I need things to make me secure. Okay. So I think that we, so the number of $4 million doesn't mean much to me, but a house that's paid off means a lot. Mm, you know, like me. our family, think things could easy turn. I believe things are going to turn, you know. No one would say that we're, we're cheap, right? Um, but we are not flashy no. either, right, at all. We, we buy what we need, mostly. Do you need an helicopter or a plane? <laughs> That's his, well, no, his no. toys. But we need, we need to have fun and we need fulfillment and we need challenges. So as a pilot, one of the things I like about it most is how it fulfills me as a person. It's the, it's the challenge. It's, the, it's the, um, the stimulus, the mental stimulus I get, you know. I want to ask you this because, you know, the very vast majority of Americans that are living in America, sorry, and, and maybe people that are watching too, you know, they don't have that ease of money, right? And, and you guys, for the most part, like when we think about the money that you guys have accumulated, how much of that was coming from your parents? I mean, I guess $300,000 from you on the land, but what else? Have you built everything that you own? Well, or did you, all of it. Or did you... All of it. Yeah. And what for you, how today do you justify and you explain that recipe that has made you successful? I, I see a lot of people, especially in America, just wasting gobs of money, right? So the bikes, the, my favorite dirt bike to buy, and this is what I always look for, is a bike that someone bought brand new. They rode it once. It scared them. <laughs> so they kept it in the garage for two years and I buy it. Two years later, that it's got like one hour on it, and I'm buying at half price. And so if that person wasted half the value of the bike, totally, you know. And you can relate that to everything, right? Like what? So, well, vehicles. They see people spending a terrific amount of money on vehicles. So they're losing all this money, right? So it's not that we've done, oh, in some ways, it's not that we've done really well making money. We've just done really well not losing money. So if someone goes out and buys a brand new car, just look at the 
horrible economic situation that puts them in. Not only the devaluation, not only the interest they're paying on that money, but they're paying top money for the registration. I have never owned a new car, never bought a new car, um, have no, no desire to. I don't think I will. Um, I don't like the economics of buying a new car. It's like a terrible idea. Um, what, do I, you car, what do you drive today? Predominantly Toyotas. I love um, those. Um, and if someone's looking for a car, the best car to buy in my mind is a Toyota with 100,000 miles on it. Why? Because the first owner of that lost a lot of money with that $100,000. You're buying a car that will do another $100,000, in fact, $200,000, trouble-free. My last truck I sold had 260,000 miles on it, and it was totally original. So I'm always looking for that opportunity to get the best value out of something. Now that we know a little bit more about your income and your assets, let's move on to our next section, which looks at your expenses. Well, guys, for the most part, here we're going to make something a little bit more concise because you own everything that you have. Right. If we look at the amount of debt that you have today, how much is that? Zero. Zero. So every single thing that we've mentioned previously, your cars, your houses, your helicopter, your planes, all of that, always paid it in cash. Yes. Yeah. How do you save money for those investments? What's the mindset that you guys put yourself under? The mindset is how do I motivate myself to save for those things? Yeah. Is knowing that the only option is to pay cash. No other way. No other way. Yeah. No other way. Never considered. And for the right investment deal, yes, I would. Like I said, don't get into debt unless it's an investment. If for the right investment deal came along, yes, I would consider debt for that, for sure. Um, but generally, I want to be free. Like, I, I just want to be free. I want to live a free life. So I don't want to be encumbered by debt. What is your guys' credit score today? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Do you guys use credit cards, don't you? Yeah. Uh, I use yeah, debit yeah. cards. We don't use credit cards much. So we don't have... Yeah, so it's not that high because we don't have debt, right? So probably 760, something like that. But you don't use credit cards? Because I don't see much. Yeah, we I recently have been using it because we get cash back using the point system. But we don't really uh, pay interest. Of course. You, you know, always pay, pay, it pay it off. Everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You guys are spending on things maybe that are not the prime, like travel. You guys have tra travel and so on. But you're flying in... Economy when you fly to yeah. Spain, right? You're not bowling on business class neither. So yeah. looking at some of your expenses at restaurants, you guys seem to really like like Applebee's, you know. <laughs> but yeah. would you use something like a grocery delivery service or no? No, no. never. We have never used that. No, Why? I don't like that. Because the money you pay for them to deliver to you is really crazy. And it's not necessary. If it was like, so we use Amazon, for example, and Amazon. everything's delivered. Yeah, but, but what about food? The economics of buying things from Amazon rather than going to a retail store pay off. Yeah. Exactly. Right? It's cheaper to get it delivered. Less gas, less time. Yeah. Um, grocery delivery, I don't know if the, the, it's, it's the economics pay off. I'm not sure of that. No. I really looked no. at what that. about like Starbucks and stuff? Do you guys consume a lot of that? Or not no? Starbucks. Uh, don't like we don't Starbucks. go to Whole Foods. We don't. We like Panera Bread. That's the same Sometimes, thing. Sometimes, yeah. Um, but we, I, I buy groceries for the whole week in a local market that is called La Bonita. La Bonita. Oh, you it's guys don't go to Whole Foods or any of those? No, or the Mexican meats, or Mexican market. Yeah. It's great price. With actually Organic produce food. there, fruit and veggies. It's the best fruit and veggies. Better than all the supermarkets, the big chains. Better quality. So how do you explain? that, you know, average Americans and people that are sitting on those seats here that are crumbled in credit card debt, in the worst type of debt, but they still take, you know, DoorDash for food delivery or they still get their Starbucks every single day. How do you explain that? They think that all those little charges don't matter. And yeah. You know, they're just lots of little charges. But all those little charges, those little ways to lose money, mount up to be a lot. So... With zero dollar of debt, yep. a pretty good, you know, expense report, how much do you guys save per month? I guess we save money in the company. The company makes profit 
and it'll sit in the company and then I'll draw from the company. I see. But so that has been like, the same mechanism. Yeah, that's been the mechanism. So it hasn't, but it's not a, like a, a formal this much each. I always expect to find a way to, you know, so like I started working hard in America um, because I wanted a helicopter. Before that I was working 10 hours a week because I wanted to ride my dirt bike and I was riding my dirt bike for 10 years and working like 10, 20 hours a week. And then I got interested in helicopters and got my pilot's license. I'm like, I need to have a helicopter. So I started working hard and then I bought a helicopter. All right. Let me walk you through a little bit about kind of what I think about your finances. Okay. 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 That's going to be the ears. interesting part. I think I already know what you're going to say. <laughs> what am I going to say? <laughs> what am I going to say? That um, I should stop investing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, m what I think the biggest thing that I'm worried about you guys mm. is that you're worth four plus million dollars. But when we look at the amount of cash that you have, it's $10,000. Right. This to me is a massive red flag. It's massive. Mm. I mean, you have some liquidity more or less in your crypto and in your stock investments you know, about 200 or so thousand dollars in it. So that's fair. But I think the diversification of your assets is highly inefficient. Okay. Wow. Uh, because when we kind of sum a little bit about everything that you have, more than any person of what you own is in real estate, which is illiquid assets. And the little assets that you have invested on the stock market are in, you know, a bunch of stocks that don't mean anything. And on Cardano, which <clears throat> is a B-tier type of crypto that is fluctuating like no tomorrow. Wow. So when we think about your investment profile, it's all over the place. Oh, yeah, I might agree. <laughs> it is interesting because you guys are, in a way, representative of a lot of the European mindset where a very few portion of the European population actually invest in stocks. Most of their investments are always in real estate. Mm. Uh, and so you guys are definitely representing that well. Um, but w having that, you know, in, in a way you're telling me that this provides you with a sense of security, but to me, it's a little bit about the opposite. A lot of the direction at which your money is invested is independent of your control and you're not able to benefit from rapid changes in the market. So what I mean by that is right now as an investment or as an investor profile, you know, you are stuck. You, you, it, to me, it seems that this is a kind of a firm stock position because all of the assets that you have for the most parts will take time to, you know, to sell at a certain value and so on. Whereas when something like this arises, let's say there is fluctuations in the stock market or fluctuations in the economy or in the positioning of the real estate that you guys are in. What's nice to see is that you're located in, in New Zealand, in, in Europe, and in the United States. So mm -hmm. at least you're not all betting on one economy. But having that much illiquidity, to me, is, is very, very risky, especially as I think about some more tax-advantageous things that you guys could benefit in the United States. Um, this is kind of how I would think about your situation. Number one, I would cash out almost 90% of what you have in crypto. I don't disagree with the aspect to be involved in it, but I think that number one, being highly leveraged in one cryptocurrency is, is overly risky. Um, personally, the ideal portfolio for an investor, my recommendation, no financial advice, is to be about 10 to 20% in cryptocurrency. Okay, when it's in your case, because you have so much illiquid assets on the side, you can allow yourself to put some risk. But having today over 80% of your liquid assets, think about this, 80% of your liquid assets are invested in one of the highest fluctuating cryptos. The risk profile that you're putting yourself under is astronomical. The average investor at your age should probably be around, you know, a four to five out of 10. With your risk profile, you're probably right now at a nine out of 10. So you're exposing yourself incredibly. Personally, if I were you, I would put in your situation $100,000 in 
into either a higher saving account or in something that we call a treasury bill. Okay? This is going to give you about 5% a year. If you put into a treasury bill, you will benefit from a tax incentive because you're not paying uh, local and state tax. Okay? But that's money that is available if you put into a higher saving, for example, at any time, but you're earning 5% on it. So you're fighting against inflation. Number is, it, is 5% saving against inflation? I mean, inflation is at six. So you're fighting a little bit against it. But it's right. safe investments. It's almost guaranteed. Number two, uh, I would definitely reevaluate your investment into the stock market. I mean, it's fifty thousand dollars. It's not crazy when compared to the rest of your uh, assets. But I would, I want, I just want for you to rebalance your diversification of how you've invested your assets. Maybe being a little bit more aggressive towards a brokerage. But at its root, at the end of the day, I need you guys to have at least twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars of cash in your checking account or in that form. $10,000, $10,000 compared to 4 million of net worth is something that I've never seen. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> $10,000 in cash compared... And on top of that, you know, if something was to arise, like an investment proposition that comes to your front door, you know, some, an opportunity that arises as an investor... You always want to have about 20% or so of your assets ready to go in. That's, that's kind of a rule of terms that I like to oblige by, is that any time a real investor, someone that considers themselves as such, should always have 20% right away accessible. Mm. And that's kind of not really the case. When it comes to retirement, you guys are not set up at all for any of that. And you're missing on crazy tax incentives. Okay, because right now, for example, on all of the investments that you have, the stock and the crypto, you're being charged like crazy on capital gains at the rate that's probably astronomic if you were to pull out that money up to 20%. Whereas if you were to invest that money into smart in retirement positions, today you can cash out in a couple of years, especially for your partner, at peanuts because it's already taxed that you've paid. So you're being double taxed right now on some of your investments. So I want you guys to consider kind of different things. When I think about estate planning, do you have any estate planning in place? Like a trust, a will, any of that? Mm, our primary residence is in a trust. Okay. I would encourage you to actually start putting more and more of those assets into what I call a revocable living trust. I think this is the best applicable for your situation where you both of you are in that trust because what's going to happen if something was to arise and money was to be delivered, you know, either to your wife or vice versa. I don't know who owns the assets if it's under two names, but let's say all the assets are under your name and she's taking that up. There is going to be so much estate fees that you're going to be losing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Whereas if you're putting today the steps in place to create that estate planning, I would meet with a lawyer here locally and you're like, this is kind of what I'm looking at. And he's going to tell you step by step, how could you at some point, if something was to arise on either case, be as efficient as you can in your transposition, in your uh, inheritance of assets, okay? Because for me right now, looking at yours as individuals, there are three things that I want you to achieve. That's what I would do if I was in your shoes. Number one is protection, insurance on everything. Insurance is the highest, is probably the highest threats of high net worth individuals, lack of insurance, lack of coverage. Number two is estate planning, because that's going to be the name of the game. How can you uh, better your uh, your strategy when it comes to, you know, providing that money to, you know, your spouse and, and, and to your future children? And number three is going to be a pure tax game. Today, you are highly tax inefficient. Mm. What, you, what you're having is, and, and don't get me wrong, mm. is a basic investor with a tremendous amount of money. There are so many additional options here that you can put in place to elevate your tax gain and about retaining kind of the, the, the gains that you're making of those investments. So are you guys actually meeting with a, with a financial advisor of, of that form or no? No. So... 
like you know, I invested in another company, like four hundred thousand. That pretty much lost that. Um, invested in other stocks that aren't listed here. Lost that. Invested in crypto. Lost you know, hundred seventy thousand a year. Um, because I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Right. But I didn't know where to go to find out what to do really other than just really conservative investment uh portfolios you know but I that was i didn't really want a, just a really conservative investment portfolio i wanted some high risk and i didn't know where to get the answers for that so i just jumped in myself and you got oh, cats stock and i lost it but, and you got cats yeah <laughs> so but we're um, in Las vegas baby you know so so personally when it comes to financial advisory I think I think you you have to just be careful with who you work with because you know a financial advisor generally they take about one percent of what's going on okay that's right. kind of how it happens right you invest a hundred thousand dollars and they're going to take the one percent fee per year for you to manage the money where they invested yeah if I was in your shoes you know like many you could invest into uh, you know companies. You can set up a mutual funds, everything that you want. But at its root, the core of your investment, to me, if you want to beat the market and beat most of the financial advisors, now you're into the hyper wealth, not the hyper hyper wealth, but you're in a strong wealth where getting financial advising, especially on tax, could be beneficial. But at its root, if you want to satisfy the base on your own, personally, mate, I would uh, invest into the ETFs like the S&P 500, the Nasdaq, a little bit play on dividends. Mm. But picking individual stocks, to me, I mean, you're putting yourself at risk and you, you've proven it has not been right. the, the most beneficial case. So as we think about those three cases in, in living today, protection, estate planning, and tax gain is how I would think about your financial okay. situation. But I think the, your, your perception on money is definitely something very interesting that you both bring coming from a farmer family and, uh, you know, a poor family, you guys have made it in the United States with definitely atypical techniques, but at its root, you know, you're showcasing uh, traits that I'm hoping many people that are on this and watching this, uh, this show uh, would learn from and I've learned myself as well. So I appreciate you guys for coming along and kind of telling me a little bit more about all of that as well. As we wrap up our discussion, I want to hear kind of final words that you're speaking to, you know, kind of a very wide variety of, of viewers that we have here. Some of them are struggling. Some of them are making it great. But f learning from your experience, learning from your roots, what would you say? Uh, don't waste. That probably is the first advice. Don't waste and... Well, because I'm very atypical, I, like I don't buy handbags, I don't buy anything like it's expensive or nothing like that. Um, but I don't know if it's, that's the culture here, because that's how I grew up, not showing off anything, because we didn't have anything to show off. So I didn't change because I was in a wealthy country. And my advice is probably, yeah, save money, don't waste. And a purse, it's rather to have $5,000 inside a normal purse than buying a $5,000 purse. Excellent. Develop your financial um, philosophy, philosophy as young as you can because it's really hard to change it later on in life. So we're talking about how we are, are somewhat frugal, right? Mm -hmm. Or humble in our spending. Um, yeah, that, I grew up on a farm and Gloria grew up in, in Chile. And it comes from, from that really, you know. If there's like younger viewers watching, I'd say invest into yourself. Um, at that earlier stage in your life, like in your 20s and your 30s, and more than the money side of things, invest into the skills, the experiences, um, the education, because, and we've certainly seen it here in Las Vegas, if you get to 40 years old 
and you've not educated and you have no particular skills and very little experience, no one's really looking to give you any break at all. The breaks aren't there. Like, opportunities are not there. But if you're young and 20, you can be, you can have nothing. But if you um, have an attitude that you want to invest into yourself, all kinds of doors are open. I see. All right, guys, as I often try to mention, um, you know, your 20s is definitely a, a time for you to learn. Your 30s, you apply, and hopefully in your 40s, you enjoy, and it's kind of been <laughs> your run in life. Thank you very much, guys, for watching this video. We'll see you in another one. Till then, à bientôt.